All right, welcome back, friends. It is uh, Thursday night again, and we're dropping another uh, Judges Bible study. And I am JP. I am lead pastor here at West Covina Hills Seventh Avenue Church, and this is Pastor Jillian, youth pastor at West Covina Hills. And so we are super excited again to be with you, and mm -hmm. we're going to look into Othniel tonight. But first, uh, Pastor Jillian, would you pray for us? Absolutely. Precious Lord, thank you so much for the righteous example of Othniel, for his courage, for his endurance, um, for, for his deliverance at such an advanced age. Lord, I pray that you will give us the endurance of Othniel. Please open up our minds as we enter into this Bible study. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I feel like there should have been a class in seminary about how to pronounce names. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I'm just saying, nobody ever, they don't tell you how to pronounce. Uh, but anyway. Um, Fair enough. Fair we'll enough. see. We'll see. We'll see. I, I could already hear she has a different you know, Othniel. way of pronouncing his <laughs> name, but that's okay. It's, it's all good. We are in the book of Judges, chapter 3 and verse 7, and I'm going to begin. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God Ooh. and served Baals and Asherahs. Ooh, the Asherahs. So, hmm. It didn't take long, huh? Nope. Nope. Not it's long at all. Yeah, you know, they did evil, and they forgot the Lord their God. Mm. I, I feel like, um, I, I feel like there must be time here. It doesn't say, right? Mm -hmm. But don't you think it's not maybe one generation? Um, uh, Othniel was around during the during the conquest, so it's not even a full generation gone. So how did they? go from Joshua, they're like, we're going to do right, we're going to obey the Lord. Could this be a regional thing? I mean, I have a map here. Othniel mm -hmm. was down near uh, Debir, mm -hmm. which is kind of in the south. Is it possible that because they're on the other side? Anyways, I'm, I'm, you know, yeah, yeah. it's possible that because of the separation and they're far distant, that it's just that area that, you know, has disobeyed. I, I just struggle with mm -hmm. that everybody walked away from God. You that know. quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's amazing how quickly people scatterbrain forget. I mean, Moses was only up on the mountain for 40 days before everyone went wild and created a, created a golden calf. Yeah, it doesn't take long. You're right. I, I just struggle with it. Um, you know, there's always faithful people, obviously. Right. But the picture that is painted here is so stark. I, I do think there must be a regional element to it. Mm. I, I think so. Mm. It's just my opinion. Right. Um, and maybe this hasn't been much discussed or, or you know, talked about with this book. But I feel like mm. there must be some type of regional element where, mm. you know, we're going to see in verse 8, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishatham, uh, king of Mesopotamia. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I'm looking at Cushan and, you know, that's uh, his his area would have been, you know, what we call Syria today. But um, mm -hmm. his, his land was would have been in the south. So, you know, I, I doubt maybe that he's up attacking Mount Tabor or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like it's possible that what we're seeing here in the Bible is that the southern part of the the land of Israel was being attacked and mistreated mm -hmm. and God rose up Othniel to to deal with that but it could be there there there's a number of points in the in biblical history where they splintered spiritually where mm -hmm. one kept with things and one didn't I mean this isn't like a big theological thing right, but right. it's just one of those things that you know I'm reading these stories um you know we're going to get into uh yeah either way either way it goes it's still sad because whether whether it's everyone losing their minds like they did um 40 days you know just 40 days of moses up in the mountain they lost their minds and built an idol and as an entire nation messed up um or the event with phineas when they um are uh you know near the jordan and the um the, the women of 
the country Moab. of Moab, <laughs> Moab begin yeah. to intermingle with, mm-hmm. yeah, and they lose their minds and they're in an orgy. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, they're it happens, yeah. right? Um, where where you lose your mind, and I I don't know how to apply this to myself or the people I know. Really, maybe it's because Christianity today is more um, mainstream. Uh, uh, you know, where it's not that, I wonder if we lived in maybe a Muslim country or a communist country where nobody around us believed like us, that the mm. pressures of, you know, society around us would push us to, you know, fall into line with that. Because that's what they mm. were. They were surrounded by heathen countries. People didn't believe in God, right? Right, right. Um, but here in America, um, you know, even though we move farther and farther away from being Christian civilized, right? But it's still a strong part of our culture. Well, where where I see American Christianity doing the equivalent of this and kind of running wild is um, in taking on powers that God never asked mm. the Christians to do. Sure. Christ, American Christians have really become the worst when it comes to seizing power that God never asked us to seize. Um, in trying to take away people's freedom of choice in different areas of life, um, and just trying to legislate things that that God always intended to be up to individual conscience. Um, it, power, power is the aphrodisiac of the Christian Church. It's the idol of the American Christian Church. I think part of that, and and I, you know, this is from a uh, interesting discussion. But anyways, when the church loses God's spiritual power. It will seek mm. political power to mm. replace it. Um, when we become, when our ability to do our job, which is to save mm-hmm. souls, is lost, we mm-hmm. want the government to step in to help us to right. you know, accomplish our purpose. Now, where I see a more direct pa- parallel is that they, the, the specific sin they did this time was they served the Baals and the Asherahs. All right, so these were pagan gods. What were they gods of? One was... Um, one was a sun sky god type thing, and one was a very sexy uh, moon goddess. Um, the artwork of which I have seen in archaeology class, and it is woo. Um, basically, basically what we're looking at here is that um, it was their sexuality that enticed them away. I mean, these these were very sexy gods. The the creation myths involving these gods were like woo. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, prostitutes were used in the worship of these gods. Yeah. Um, and the thing that's interesting about living in, in what I call Christendom, you know, a culture where Christianity is dominant, is that even though we're in Christendom, we still collectively as a culture struggle with sexuality in various ways. Um, maybe the biggest one being the culture of pornography and how mm-hmm. uh, pervasive it is. Uh, you know, we're just attacked on every side, yeah. um, and uh, for, in in the area of the eyes, mm-hmm. um, especially, which you know is uh, especially a weakness for men. But um, women too, though. Women too, yeah. just especially men. And yeah. anyways, uh, it's just a, a struggle in our culture, and mm-hmm. um, it's hard to fight against it. So, I mean, why are we setting the tone like this so much? I think it's because we're going to see this over and over again, where mm-hmm. they do evil, where they fall short. And it's good for us to remember that that's not something over there that we can't relate right. to. The stories and Judges are just so fun and so even ridiculous in places. Mm-hmm. The one I have next week is pretty crazy. Um, that it's easy to just treat them as, they did what? And treat them like myths and legends, mm-hmm. um, like like our Greek mythology that we keep making and remaking into, you know, different movies, you know, Percy Jackson, Hercules, etc. Sure. Um, but um, these are things that happen to real people. And even though the technology and uh, customs around them have changed over the years, essentially humanity has not. Um, and neither has the God dealing with us. Um, So we get into verse 8, and the Bible says that God, out of his anger for them falling into the hands of these foreign gods and participating in these sexual um, rituals and activities, uh, because of his anger against them, he sells them into the hand of Cushan, Rishtham, 
king of Mesopotamia. And so in other words, God allows this foreign king to come in and to take power over them, to dominate them and to put them underneath his, his authority. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rethiam uh, eight years. That's a long time. Eight years is a yeah. long time. And when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them, and it was Othniel, the son of Kenaz, uh, Caleb's younger brother. So here we are. Wow. Okay. So first of all, the children of Israel cry out to the Lord. And here's a key expression that we're going to see quite a mm -hmm. bit here in the book of Judges, is that when God's people cry out, God hears. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. I feel a lot of comfort in that. Um, yeah. They. Th what, what is interesting to me maybe is that for eight years they didn't cry out. <laughs> right. It's like they never even thought of asking God for help. Well, the Bible says they forgot. Yeah. Um, maybe in their... Um, here, here's another way we forget in our um, richness. They had a new land. They finally had homes. Yeah, they weren't living in the yeah. desert anymore. Oh, they had property and they had mm -hmm. grapevines and uh, orchards and uh, mm -hmm. you know they were they were they had the abundance of mm -hmm. product and they were rich yeah. um compared to what they were before which is living in a desert uh you know wandering around drinking from a rock spewing water um eating they were pathfinder trip roughing it for for <laughs> years decades years. Yeah. and now all of a sudden they have a rich property with uh, abundance of fruit and um, they, I, I think that that causes us when wealth comes upon us it causes us to forget about God because we don't need him as much anymore there's a um, there's a very insightful quote from um, Thornton Wilder in the play the skin of our teeth that says in war you dream of a better life in peacetime, you dream of a more comfortable one. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and, and Jesus portrays this idea with his parable about the man who had abundance and says, yeah. you know, I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build another one. Um, he's portraying the idea that, you know, when we are wealthy, instead of thinking about um, how can I serve the Lord, we're thinking about how can I get more. Right. Um, and that becomes the focus of our lives, um, which is why, and, I, you know, I don't, this is not really the topic today, but... In our culture, it's so attractive, these get-rich schemes, you know, invest this and multiply your wealth or, you know, do you want to make 10000 a month? Just, you know, watch my video and I'll help you or whatever. There's, you know, so much of that, but it's because it's appealing to us. We have so much. We're already wealthy, but there's this appeal to be so much more. You know, we right. want more. If only I could have. Or this. Then I'd be happy. You know, oh, yeah. you know, if I was making 10000 a month, I would be, you know. Then my life would be complete. <laughs> um, and so when we look at this, the Bible says they cried out to the Lord and the Lord raised up a deliverer. Um, he sent uh, someone to save them. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he raised up from among them someone with faith and with courage. And we're going to meet some of these deliverers here in the book of Judges. Uh, but... But God raises up somebody um, specifically to deliver them. And he chooses Othniel, the son of Kenaz, who was Caleb's younger brother. Now, Joshua mm -hmm. and Caleb, we read a little bit about Caleb in the book of Joshua. Caleb was the one who attacked the giants and defeated them. Uh, he mm -hmm. was the one of the spies that went into land. He was one of the two that entered the land of Canaan mm -hmm. um, who had come out of the land of Egypt. And uh, Caleb has his younger brother, Othniel, mm -hmm. who, um, who God raises up and puts the Spirit of the Lord upon. So this family, I, I would like to make a point about this. It seems like this family, um, the, the, the Lord works through this family. Yeah. There's some strength here of faith and of character. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I like Caleb. I've, mm -hmm. I've preached on Caleb. I've, yeah. Uh -huh. but, you know, to see Othniel also... Have the same spirit of strength and of faith um, says that there was something going on. Those parents did something right in raising these kids. Well, and it's it's highly likely that Othniel was a half brother because here it says Othniel is son of Kenaz and um, Caleb was son of Jephunneh. 
-hmm. So it's 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 quite probable that they had the same mother, and um, Othniel was the son of the second marriage. There you go. Um, but what's cool about this to me is that you know it's it's in a little brother's nature, or even a little sister's nature, to look up to his or her <laughs> older brother, sure and to kind of want so badly to be a part of their world, and to mm -hmm. want to tag along. And the older sibling has two choices. They can either um, be all like, ugh, I don't want my younger sibling ta tailing me, or ugh, mm -hmm. I will not acknowledge I'm related to you in public. Or they can be all, all right, come, engage with my world, I'll teach you everything I know. Um, and I see, I see here that Caleb probably actually owned his brother, acknowledged his brother, and, mm -hmm. and um, let him in, and actually had the relationship. Even though it's likely that there was as much as a 20-year gap between them. Yeah. And being half-brothers, it's possible that with that gap, they maybe were not, you know, intimately Quite as up in each other's or, faces sure. as some sibling That's pairs right. I'm thinking of in, our, in, in, in my youth group right now. When we get to verse 10, though, things open up and get super exciting. Because yeah. the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord mm. came upon him. And I just want to stop here and sit on this for a minute. Yeah. Um, I think that this is talking about a supernatural amount mm. of God's energy, passion, focus, mm. emotion, love, um, awareness. Mm. Um, I don't know all the words that I can put on this, mm. but they're, they're, the Bible emphasizes, and we're going to see this expression more and more mm. as we go through the book of Judges, and this is a good time to talk about it, mm. is that something supernatural happens here. Right. Um, something causes Othniel to wake up and to become more courageous, more strong, more faithful, uh, more driven. And the key ingredient is not his effort. Right. It's not his intelligence. It's not his strength. Mm -hmm. It is the spirit of the Lord. This also brings up something interesting that's rattling around my brain because I'm teaching on this in a couple of days. We usually think of spiritual gifts as being very churchy things. Mm -hmm. We think of preaching. We think of, um, you know, maybe if you're broad-minded enough, you might think of, of craftsmanship or of, sure. um, you know, hospitality, mm -hmm. if you're thinking slightly more outside the Christian box. But here we have someone who is given, filled with the Spirit of the Lord, to engage in warfare, which is which feels weird, right? Of course, he is a judge, which right. we're going to talk for a minute about the role of the judge. The role of the judge versus the role of the warrior general. Is it right. possible to be a judge without being a general or a warrior? You know, uh, right. I don't know. We'll right. discuss that in a minute. But yes, go ahead. But um, something that just clicked for me is that if there's a task that God needs accomplished in His work, no matter what it is. Uh, he can give someone, empower someone with a spiritual gift for it, even if it's not one of the classically listed ones. Absolutely. 100%. And God will do that to accomplish his purpose. Yeah. Um, and, what, and what he wants to do, whatever that might be. Yeah. Um, that, that person will feel inspired, driven, passionate to fulfill mm. that role. There are um, lawyers with the Spirit of God on them. The, the other thing that I want to say about this mm -hmm. is that, you know, not everybody is going to get that supernatural amount of the Spirit of the Lord. No. No, no, no. But it does mean that God does do it at times. He does. Um, you know, I, I will say, because we have history, we have a church full of history, mm -hmm. that there are people that I can look at in our denominations, his, mm -hmm. denominations history where I really can see that there was some supernatural anointing on their life. I mean, um, the dead obvious one being Ellen White, of course. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> it's cheap to say that, though. I right, like... right. That's like saying Deborah. <laughs> yeah, right. Sure. <laughs> I, I, I want to say um, HMS Richard Sr. Richards. Well, I mean, the influence, the radio ministry, yeah, the yeah. evangelism ministry... Um, I, we don't, so our generation doesn't know it, but the influence that he had and Eric um, B. Hare and his storytelling and his oh, work in the mission field. Powerful. Absolutely. I, and I would say that, that, that Maxwell was, was spiritually okay. anointed right. to, uh -huh. to write books that would disciple generations of children. <laughs> uh, um, 
I was just thinking of, um, man. If you don't know who these guys are, look them up. Their books are really fun. Yeah, yeah. Bible story books and the... Um, Eric P. Hare's books are really fun, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I, it isn't our job to, to list off them. All. Right, 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 right. But you can see that they rise above. Mm -hmm. Mark Finley, mm -hmm. even in his old age, his impact mm -hmm. today on the church and what he's doing, yeah. uh, where he served, um, you know, uh, there's just certain people right. um, that, that, that excel above and beyond Mm -hmm. And the Spirit of God works through in a powerful, mighty way for a purpose. And there's some people where just hanging hanging out with them, you can almost feel the intensity of their spirituality. Not that they're wearing it heavy-handedly, just brush off of them. There's a seminary professor named Joseph Kidder who I very much get that get that off of. I, I, I very much get that yes. feeling of someone who has spent a great deal of time in the presence of God. And we just spent some time with him yeah, recently. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, he, he has influenced a generation of pastors, mm -hmm. leaders, where he has mentored them to have a closer walk with God. Yeah. Um, I, I think that when God has something he wants to accomplish, he pours out his spirit on mm -hmm. somebody to accomplish that purpose. Yeah. Um, and I... I I would like to take it to the next step and say that the Spirit of God is available to us, yeah. too. Oh, yeah. um, th there's passages in the New Testament where Jesus says, if you want to ask for something, ask for the Spirit, mm -hmm. and God will give it because He wants to bless you. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel like the Spirit of God is available to us, too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that this is a special anointing, and so I don't right. want to say that all of us will receive this. But the Spirit of God is available to the us. The world doesn't need an entire population of generals only. Some of us have to do quieter, more invisible things. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, not everybody can be lead pastors, right? Right. Uh, or wants to. There, <laughs> there you go. Exactly. <laughs> uh, not everybody can be an elder. We need deacons. Yeah. Uh, not everybody can be... Yes, we get the point. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and then it says, and he judged Israel. So that's the first thing it says. He judged Israel. So the first um, power, the anointing he receives, and here is the, the main... This mm -hmm. is the book of Judges. <laughs> so here's this judge, and it's Othniel, the younger brother of Caleb, and he's given the spirit of the Lord so that he can judge Israel. What does that mean? What is a judge? What do judges do? Mm -hmm. um, we see judges that they would sit at the gate. Yeah. Um, they were the elders of the people. And the, the children of Israel would bring their case before them. Mm -hmm. We see this in the time of Moses. Moses was the judge. Yeah. But then um, and the, uh, the, his father-in-law came to him and said, Hey, you can't judge every case. You need to have judges mm -hmm. underneath you. You should only be doing the most difficult. Um, there was a system set yes. up in Israel's culture to handle the the making the peace yes. of the people, yes. bringing peace to the people. And it seems like the first job of the Spirit of the Lord coming upon his leaders was to make them judges to bring peace to his people. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big deal. It is. I, I think... Now I'm just going to talk as a pastor. All right. That people think that maybe my number one job is preaching, which I think is important, uh, or um, by, get, you know, baptizing people, which is important. All that is important. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if our first job is to be the judge of God's people to help bring the peace, to help them work through their issues, to help them to process how to act, how to live, to help them to understand how to relate to one another so that they can... Uh, how, how do I say this? So that the stumbling blocks that cause us to not be able to reach our full potential mm -hmm. can be eliminated well, so that we can be who, yeah. If you think about it, preaching, Bible studies, baptizing, all of those contribute towards that end, towards helping people mm -hmm. become more fully who God designed them to be. Absolutely. Um, you know, baptism is just one step on a whole long love story we each have with God. Um and I, I see very much our role as leaders to help edge people closer to God 
in any way we can mm -hmm. and towards each other. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're dead right there. The, the, the idea of a judge seems to be foreign to us. When we think of a judge, we think of this professional in a court. But God has set up in his system judges, people whose job is to help God's people mm -hmm. to resolve their issues and to find the right path, the right answers. Um, and we do a lot of that, whether yeah. people realize it or not. A, yeah. a big part of our job is to help God's people be at peace and to learn how to relate to one another. Yeah. Because... God's people have a lot of conflict. Because they're people and yeah. people are messed up. <laughs> <laughs> so the Bible says he judged Israel and then it says he went out to war and the Lord delivered Cushan Rishatham, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand and his hand prevailed over Cushan. So the land had rest for 40 years. 40! Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Um, so, 40 years, um, this this regional area of Othniel had peace. Um, he was the judge, and uh, God's people um, were safe. Um, but he not only, I guess this is the next level of it, right? Not only did he become a judge mm -hmm. and help God's people to be at peace and to seek the Lord, spiritually focus on God, but he also went out to battle against the evil mm -hmm. that was enslaving them. Yeah. And um, he attacked those things that were um, keeping them under authority and defeated them, but not in his own strength. Mm -hmm. The victory was not from Othniel. It wasn't because he was smart or good. The Lord was on their side again. Yeah. Because the judge rose up, led God's people back to the Lord through the spirit mm -hmm. of the God, and then now God's fighting for them again. And so they find the deliverance, mm -hmm. and they find the victory that they need. When I think of the role <laughs> of the judges, what I think of is direction, um, mm. leadership. And we, we use the word leadership here and there in all kinds of crazy ways. And sometimes people are designated as leaders who just really aren't actually leading anyone anywhere. Um where we see people fall away from God is when they no longer have the direction of being guided towards God. Hmm. And it's not that the leaders are a magic bullet that um, automatically cause victory. It's not like, you know, it's a Superman. Um, <laughs> yes. The judges of the Bible, um, a lot of how God works his deliverance through them is through using them to bring direction to his people so that mm -hmm. together they all accomplish God's Amen. will. Amen. I, you know, uh, that, that's one class that I don't feel like they spend enough time with at seminary or even training pastors mm. is leadership. Oh, yeah. Um, and it is a, a passion of mine, mm. but I find that, that it's something maybe that we don't spend enough time talking about. Um, I, I like Maxwell, and this is not our Maxwell, but the the, the other Maxwell, the leadership Maxwell. Yeah. Uh, but I like what he says, and that is a leader ha is somebody who has followers. That's mm -hmm. the very nature and definition. In other yeah. words, the leader isn't about what he does. The leader is all about what he can cause other people to do around him, how right. he influences and makes a difference in people's lives. And uh, these judges that are going to rise up one after another, their impact is not just in killing or in war or in destruction, mm -hmm. but it's about rallying God's people to once again to turn their lives back to God mm -hmm. and to restore the faith in God and the belief in God. And, um, you know, I guess we're like sheep. We need a shepherd <laughs> because over and over again, God is sending leaders yeah. to, to save them. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know um, where this leads you in your thought process, but I guess my appeal is to uh, consider our lives. Where are we at? Um, uh, maybe we need a revival of the Spirit of God. Jesus is coming soon. Yeah. Um, the world seems to be more and more corrupt, mm -hmm. uh, more and more evil around us. Mm -hmm. uh, it gets harder and harder to focus and to make sure that God is our our number one priority, and uh, maybe this is just judges is a wake up call for us yeah. to remember that um, uh, seek first mm -hmm. the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Mm -hmm. Let's pray, 
Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the uh, faith and the courage and the and the power and strength of Othniel. And thank you for giving him your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for saving your people out of the <clears throat> destruction and the, the pain that they brought upon themselves. And Lord, save us from the pain and destruction that we bring upon ourselves. Mm -hmm. Turn our hearts towards you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.